For many of us, it's seen as our crowning glory, but the global trade in human hair is the focus of a new book by a Goldsmith University of London anthropologist. Professor Emma Tarlow's book, Entanglement, The Secret Lives of Hair, looks at the history, culture and industry associated with what's on our heads. I'm very pleased to say Emma joins London Live News this lunchtime, along with a collection of some of the hair that's uh, being talked about in this book. First, tell us a bit about why this was a topic that was so close to your heart. Yes, I just became very fascinated by the idea that something that's as personal and sort of individual as human hair that actually grows from our own bodies can end up uh, travelling around the world uh, quite extensively because a lot of the hair that's on the market in, in Europe or in the United States is actually coming from South Asia uh, or China and it's often going on a very long circuit before it actually reaches uh, the UK market. So I was interested in trying to look at the stories attached to you know, why people are selling their hair or donating it, all the different types of trade that are linked to the hair uh, along the way and how it then arrives and becomes incorporated into people's identities uh, on the other side of the world, really. Talking of which, tell us a bit about the hair that you've brought along with you today. Yes. Well, these hair samples were given to me by a retired uh, American hair dealer in, in New York. And this one is actually Italian hair uh, from a sort of a young girl. Uh, and it's very, very sort of soft and silky. This is actually Chinese hair that's been bleached and dyed blonde, but it's got a much coarser kind of texture. And this, interestingly, is uh, yak hair, which has also been used quite extensively in the hair industry. Um, beards can be made from yak hair, and some of the early Afro wigs were also made uh, from yak hair. And the, the term yaki texture, which you see in the hair market a lot, is actually derived from the kind of slightly frizzy nature of the yak hair. How new an industry is this? It's not new at all. It's a very ancient industry. And although I haven't gone extensively into the history of it, I did look quite a lot at sort of late 19th century because what surprised me was that actually we were importing a lot of hair from China, even in the sort of 1860s and 70s, and uh, where people would wear sort of very elaborate uh, sort of Victorian hairstyles that were built uh, uh, often using uh, wedges of hair either from China or from uh, France and uh, uh, Italian peasants and so on. So there was, it's, it's really quite an extensive thing. Shops selling wigs, selling yeah. hair extensions are commonplace in London. You see yeah. them all over the place. Yeah. Are they intricately linked with exploitative methods around the world or is there any such thing as fair trade hair? Fair trade hair, it's an interesting idea. I mean, there are certainly some companies that claim to be selling ethical hair, but how they define ethics is quite a complicated thing. So some companies will say, oh, well, if we take hair from Indian temples, then the women have gone to Indian temples to get their heads shaved as part of the sort of religious rite. So they've done it voluntarily. They don't get any money for the hair, but the temple will sell the hair. So some companies will call that ethical hair because it's being gathered in that way. Others will say it's only ethical if someone gets some money for selling it. But of course, there's always the problem of how much money people get for selling it. So, you know, I've seen in, in Myanmar, for example, you know, women with very, very long hair and they'll sell, you know, this much in length and they'll get about seven pounds for it. It's not going to change their lives and it'll take a long time to grow back. And the other market that's very interesting is the market for uh, combings, which is just waste hair that falls from people's heads and is collected up out of sort of brushes and combs uh, throughout South Asia. So there, you know, uh, this amount of combings would generate about 80 pence, 80 pence on the door uh, and then it has to be untangled and of course the pay of the workers who are untangling comb waste is very, very low. It's one of the cheapest. With that in mind, just briefly, are you calling for tighter regulations of the sorts of hair we'll find being sold in London? Well, I think there is a need for regulation in the human hair industry. Uh, it'd be incredibly difficult to do because it's not like a sort of crop that you can just sort of harvest. Although people refer to the harvest, it's, it, you can't gather it in any uh, straightforward way. You know, it's growing on people's heads in a very dispersed way. And it passes through so many hands before it reaches the, the big factories that uh, it'd be very, very difficult to regulate. But, but there is need for regulation for sure.